you know, in my early 40s, I just woke up and thought, how did I get here? I didn't start off as a radical Jesus freak only to end up as just, you know, a Republican with a Jesus fish on his SUV. I, I began to return to a demanding radical allegiance to Christ. And I knew that that's what was happening. So I wasn't ever doubting that. Uh, what I doubted was that we would be able to survive as a church. This is Why I Stay, a show about faithfulness in the face of judgment, hurt, and betrayal. Today's guest is the founder and lead pastor at Word of Life Church in St. Joseph, Missouri. Brian Zond came straight out of the Jesus movement and was comfortable in his brand of Christianity until he wasn't. About 15 years ago, he had some experiences and read some books that put him on a new path of faith. Now, most pastors, when they go through this, are really hesitant to share their questions and transformations with their congregation, but Brian was open and honest. In that process, he was accused of heresy and lost a lot of members of his church, but he continued to press on. His latest book, When Everything is on Fire, Faith Forged from Ashes, encourages people to renovate their faith instead of deconstructing it. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm, I come right out of the Jesus movement. Yeah, for sure. All right. So what was religion to you before that? Did you know about Jesus and you just had bad? Like, what What was it like then? Oh, yeah, of course I did. But it was, it was just, Jesus was to me, I don't know, it, Jesus wouldn't have been that much more real or significant to me than whatever, George Washington, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know. And so I wasn't, I wasn't opposed to Christianity or faith. I would have vaguely probably have thought of myself as a Christian by just default. I mean, we went to church, but it was, it wasn't, it was very nominal. Mm-hmm. And then something ignited. I mean, I, I came to know that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. I, I'd gone to a, this meeting and there was, you know, an altar call, which was, you know, very it was kind of typical revivalist sort of thing. I'd, I'd seen those things before. I knew those things happened. I just couldn't imagine it happening to me, but then it did. Uh, but even more significantly, I got home that night. Again, this is going to sound maybe strange to people, but you know, it's just it's my story. I bear witness to it. People can believe it or disbelieve it. I got home about midnight. I went into my my bedroom in the basement with its Zeppelin posters on the wall. You have to you know understand that's who I am. And suddenly the room, it it, it seemed as if it was just filled with light. And I knew that I was in the presence of Jesus. And I dropped to my knees and lifted my hands and worshiped the one who was there. Hmm. That was the real moment of encounter. And in some ways, everything in my life seems to flow from that moment. Word of Life started, what, five, six years after that? If I'm doing my math right, seven years later, I guess it would have been? By the time I was 17, Mm -hmm. two years later, I was leading a ministry here in St. Joseph, Missouri, just north of Kansas City, called the Catacombs. And the Catacombs was mostly a music venue for the Jesus movement music scene. And so that's what we would meet on Saturday nights. There'd be a concert. But then we would meet, we started meeting other nights, gathering anyway, and I started doing some teaching. And so from about 1976 up until 1981, it was slowly becoming a de facto church. And then with some help from some other uh, more established pastors, uh, we made the leap to meeting on Sunday mornings. And we actually, we, we purchased for $6,000, if you can believe such a thing, kind of an old mm-hmm. broken down Methodist church building on the corner of 11th and Sycamore and started meeting on Sundays. And mm-hmm. and so, yeah, November 1st, 1981 is our first Sunday. And that's what we date as the beginning of Word of Life Church, but it has roots that go back even further. So one of the things I tell people is I say, look, I've been doing the work of a pastor longer than I've been an adult. <laughs> and you, it grew big and fast, right? Well, not immediately. It we stayed under a hundred people for seven years. Okay, I think ninety nine or nine hundred and ninety nine times out of a thousand, 
that's going to be the story of that church. It's going to be a small mm-hmm. little church. But that wasn't our story. And beginning around 89, 90, uh, the church grew enormously, just kind of in a ridiculous way. So we, we went from this little broken down building that we bought in, in 1981. And by 1996, we had moved into a, I mean, we didn't leave that building until 89. And then seven years later, we moved into this multi-million dollar facility that we built that we're in now. And, and that's, you know, that's a typical, you know, rags to riches success story. And that could be the end of the story, mm-hmm. except in my case, in some ways, it's just the beginning. As I entered my 40s, I began to have a growing unease. Everything was great as far as the metrics of which Americans like to measure success in ministry, but I began to just sense that something was wrong. I began to, it, it felt thin to use Tolkien's language or, you know, Bilbo Baggins talks about being, it, it feels thin, like butter scraped over too much bread. And I began to have this concern that, that Jesus deserved a better Christianity than I knew. Hmm. And so this led me to begin to, to read first patri- patristics and then began to eventually read contemporary, substantial, or, or substantive theology. And I call this my water-to-wine journey that really begins in earnest in 2004. And I just I led our church away from kind of a consumerist, charismatic Christianity into a more uh, rooted historical faith, respecting the great tradition. All of that we could have done probably and not really lost very many people, although, you know, any kind of change is going to rock the boat a little bit. Right. But it's when I began to uh, critique the uh, comfortable alliance that much of the American church had with the American empire that um, that raised eyebrows and more than raised eyebrows, it produ- produced opposition. Mm-hmm. And we ended up, you know, in the mid 2000s, losing probably a thousand people. And that was a very it was a very conflicting time. In one sense, for my wife and I, it was the most exciting time. We were finally discovering the the rich, substantive, historic faith, the demanding faith of actually being a follower of Jesus, not just sort of a Jesus-fied cultural Christianity that is comfortable with America. Uh, We began to find the robust, rich, demanding Christianity we'd really always been looking for, and that was exciting, but was also going through the pain of of losing people. And so today people might look at that period of my life and say, uh, that was your deconstruction because that's the term that's in vogue these days. Mm -hmm. I prefer different kinds of metaphors. Water to wine is one way I talk about it. I talk about, I was renovating my theological house. Mm -hmm. I talk about that in the book. So, I mean, you're, you're obviously super intelligent. You've done your homework. Were you always that way? Even before you started looking at it and thinking this is thin? Or did you get a hunger later? I was a terrible student in school, Mm -hmm. but that was because I I, I think because I chose to be a terrible student. (laughs) (laughs) I always I always had liked philosophy and had read some philosophy in high school. And then, you know, with the Jesus movement and all that, I sort of just let it go because you know, the Jesus movement leads us into the charismatic renewal, leads us into word of faith, if that mm-hmm. means anything to our listeners. And believe it or not, most word of faith pastors aren't reading a lot of Kierkegaard uh, <laughs> or Heidegger or Nietzsche or or whoever. But um, a- as I began to be born again again in my early 40s, that's how I described it, I began to return to some of the things that were very central to who I am as a person. And so I began to just, you know, unabashedly say, okay, I'm going to be serious about studying philosophy. Mm -hmm. So in one sense, you know, to study philosophy in a certain context in the American church for a pastor to do that seems unusual, but historically that would be typical. That's what you would expect. Mm -hmm. That's, that would be pre-seminary training. You would know at least some philosophy. Mm -hmm. And so it's never been, I mean, there was a long period of time where I, departed from that and neglected it, but it was always an interest. And then, you know, in my forties, I really returned and began to study quite, quite seriously and quite earnestly. And it's, and it, it was good for me. And, uh, yeah, there, there is a fair amount of 
philosophy as a foundation in this book when everything's on fire. But uh, if I say so, I think I know how to make it accessible. I don't think people are going to find it daunting or anything like that. But I, but I do need to work a little bit with, with Nietzsche and, and Derrida and Kierkegaard in this book because they're important mm-hmm. to what's happening even now. From what, I, what I've heard of your story, you kind of, you were transparent going through this transformation with your congregation. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, I was. I really was. Part of what makes my story unique is, is wh- however you want to describe it. Deconstruction, not my favorite term. Right, right. Transitioning, theological reassessment, water to wine, whatever you want to call it. I did it very publicly. Mm-hmm. I, I, I don't know if it was a choice. I just thought I don't really, I don't have a choice. I mean, I, my whole life is a preaching life. I pastor, I preach. I, I'm not very good at hiding. <laughs> I mean, I preach from the passion of my heart. And if I'm discovering a richer, deeper way of talking about God revealed in Christ, which I was, well, then that's going to inform my preaching. And so people were, I mean, everybody knew. I mean, everybody in the church, certainly, but probably in the city that was interested in Christian things knew that, hey, you know, this BZ character's changing. <laughs> and and some liked it and some didn't. And uh, But it was all out there. People would come to me, though. They would say, often with concern, sometimes with accusation, well, you're changing. You're cha- as if that was a, an accusation. You're, you're changing your theology. And I would say, well, I don't know. I mean, the core has remained the same. Mm-hmm. The essentials that would be reflected in the historic creeds haven't changed. And so I would often push back on that. And I would say, well, maybe it's more nuanced. Maybe I'm adjusting. Maybe I'm growing. Uh, the, the area, though, that I would readily admit that I changed was eschatology, you know, the study of in things. I look back with fondness, deep fondness, in fact, on the Jesus movement. I enjoyed that time. I benefited from it. I'm proud to say I come from the Jesus movement, but it had terrible eschatology. This is, you know, it it really embraced the whole late great planet Earth. And then later the left behind thing would come out of that. And eventually I came to the point that I said the whole thing is wrong. So that's when I talk about renovating your theological house. Your theological house is not one thing. It's, It's this vast, sprawling mansion with maybe dozens of rooms. And when I began to realize that I needed a, I desperately needed a remodel of my theological house, meaning the palace that Christ occupied in my mind and how I think about God revealed in Christ, uh, it, it isn't, I didn't have to tear the whole house down. I mean, the room that would be called Christology probably, you know, isn't, it, it wasn't changed. You know, maybe, maybe I visit it more often. Maybe, maybe I added some new furniture or something to spend more time in it, but I didn't change it. But the whole wing of my theological house called eschatology, maybe there's where deconstruction is an appropriate term because it wasn't salvageable. So we didn't just, you know, uh, add a new coat of paint. We brought in the sledgehammer, maybe the wrecking ball, took it right down to the foundation and started over. But, you know, sometimes you have to do that. But here's the thing. People that come from a fundamentalist background often, which I wouldn't I wouldn't describe myself as that, but there are a lot that do. And unfortunately, they tend to tie their theology together as a single thing so that if one component begins to be whatever you want to say, deconstructed, then the entire faith is in danger of being lost or to say it another way. I've seen people leave the Christian faith but keep their fundamentalism. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> they just go from being a fundamentalist Christian to a fundamentalist non-Christian, but they're still a fundamentalist. Yep. And so I, I think it's good to hold, hold on to Jesus, but everything else hold on loosely.
think that your eschatology, this is kind of a side question, is that when you're being able to see through, I would, Christian nationalism is the best word I have for it, the way that right. American Christianity has been married to government. Because for, that was my story. When I started looking at eschatology and all of a sudden I'm like, oh, Christ as Lord has a lot more meaning than I was thinking it did, mm-hmm. especially on a practical day-to-day basis within my politics. Is that is your story similar to that or is it very different? Yeah, very similar. Yeah. I mean, what it meant was when I began to see that America is an empire. Mm -hmm. Now, by empire, I'm not using a term loosely. I'm not just using an empty pejorative. I'm actually being using technical language. By empire, I mean rich, powerful nations who believe they had a divine right to rule other nations and a manifest destiny to shape history according to their agenda. Mm-hmm. Now, as we look into the scriptures, God loves nations with their ethnicity and their diversity and their language and their culture, but God is always opposed to empire. This is a consistent theme quite literally from Genesis to Revelation. Mm-hmm. Because what empires claim for themselves, a divine right to rule other nations, a manifest destiny to shape history according to their agenda, is the very thing that God has promised to his son, Jesus Christ. So empires begin to impinge upon the sovereignty of God and become a rival to God. They set themselves up in opposition to God. This is not something unique with America. I mean, we've seen it throughout history, and we've seen it throughout Christian history. If if you go back, you know, 17 centuries, Constantine, so-called Christian emperor, and there you have the beginning of the conflation of Christian faith and imperial agenda, so that you end up with a Christian empire and the cross is morphed into the sword. And so this was a problem for the Roman Empire, Byzantine Empire. This was a problem in France, Spain, on and on you go, England, Portugal. Germany had a particularly ugly experience with this beginning in the 1930s. So I I saw that, and I began to see that, and I began to say that Jesus Christ is Lord, and that, as you said, that means something that has a political edge to it. Mm -hmm. When the early Christians were persecuted, they were not persecuted for what the Romans would have understood as religious reasons. The Roman Empire was actually remarkably religiously tolerant. They had to be. What they weren't tolerant of is anyone claiming that someone else was Caesar. And Lord was a title given by the Roman Senate to the emperor. So that when the early Christians say Jesus is Lord, they are by implication saying, and Caesar is not. That we live under a different king, a different empire, a different government. And that is the kind of thing that elicited persecution from the Romans. So my experience was when I began to talk like that, uh, this created real cognitive dissonance for my hearers. And they had to decide just could they hear this message or were they just going to, in frustration, leave and go somewhere else where they would hear something more palatable and wouldn't challenge their faith in that regard. Mm-hmm. So what happened was my experience was that locally there was quite a bit of opposition. Like I said, we lost a thousand people. And that was very painful because I'm, I'm, we're not just talking about numbers to Perry and I, these were people that we had maybe led to the Lord and baptized and married and baptized their kids and married their kids. And they were leaving saying, you know, Brian's gone liberal, which is how I felt about it. Brian's backslidden. I felt like, if anything, I'm drawing closer to Jesus than I've ever in my life. Right. But at the same time, that, that, that was that suddenly I was finding resonance all over the country, just wherever. I mean, for those that have ears to hear. And so it was the phenomenon of losing one group while at the same time gaining those that said, you know, we've been hearing this. We've been sensing the same thing. You're saying what what we've already been feeling. And we feel like we've got to we've got to uncouple our faith from political partisanship. Now, Christian faith is not apolitical because it has ramifications on social life. But what it's not is partisan. Mm-hmm. The problem I have with the Christian right and the Christian left both is that Christian gets reduced to adjective duty in service of the all-important ideological noun. And so people's real allegiance becomes to a right or left ideology, and then Jesus is sort of trotted out as a mascot to endorse their particular political ideology. That's what Jesus challenges. 
Karl Barth said it this way in the context of 1930s Germany. He said, God cannot serve. God can only rule. By that, he does not mean that God cannot be a servant in the form of Christ because, of course, he is. What he means is God is not going to serve someone else's political agenda because God has his own political agenda. It's called the kingdom or government of God. And so this has been a source for prompting deconstruction in a lot of people. Sometimes it's science. Sometimes it's other social issues. Sometimes it's just the awareness that a certain brand, especially conservative American evangelical Christianity seems to conflate allegiance to Christ and allegiance to the nation into a single entity, and they realize that is no longer tenable, and then they have to navigate what they're going to do next. And and at the height of the pushback for you, did you wrestle with, man, I'm going down the wrong road, or, you know, these people who I know have loved Jesus or are being venomous towards me, what did that do to you? Just honestly, John, I mean, it's going to, I'm going to answer your questions honestly. I never had a moment of doubt that I wasn't following Jesus. You know, what had happened was, is I began as a radical follower of Jesus. And then over time, very slowly, I mean, what happens is the Jesus movement led me into the charismatic movement, which I describe as good until it wasn't. Mm-hmm. And that leads me into word of faith, which was life-giving in its to begin with, but then began to be very consumerist oriented and unhealthy. But then that leads us into the religious right movement and all of that. And it was just, you know, in my early 40s, I just woke up and thought, how did I get here? I, I didn't start off as a radical Jesus freak only to end up as just, you know, a Republican with a Jesus fish on his SUV. Right. And so I, I began to return to a demanding, radical allegiance to Christ. And I knew that that's what was happening. So I wasn't ever doubting that. Uh, What I doubted was that we would be able to survive as a church. Mm -hmm. I I didn't know. I mean, I wasn't going to leave. You know, I'm the founding pastor. I, I love this congregation like I would love my children, you know, almost. Mm hmm. But there were moments when I, I thought, I don't know if, you know, if the church will stay viable. I don't know if it'll survive this. Now, I don't leave people in suspense. I mean, it did survive, and it's doing well, and it's healthy, and we celebrated our 40th anniversary last Sunday with nothing but great joy. Mm-hmm. And the book, when everything's on fire, isn't necessarily all about that. I mean, that's – in fact, that's barely in there at all. What it really is doing is people, for whatever reason, are beginning to feel like their faith is under fire. Mm-hmm. or under pressure, or no longer viable or tenable, the book is my attempt to come alongside and say, well, before you ditch it all, let's let's talk a little bit. Let's, let's walk together for a little while, and let's have some conversations about how maybe you can untangle your faith in Jesus from things that are wrong, or toxic, or unhealthy, or compromised, but still maintain your faith in Jesus. Jesus as the Son of God, Savior of the world. I have many, many friends who have gone through, I mean, deconversion. I wouldn't even call it deconstruction at this point. Yeah. Uh, one of whom is my best friend. We've been friends since we were, you know, 15. Um, was with him the day he got baptized. Was with him when he entered into Bible college. And about three years ago, he said, I, I can't believe any of it anymore. And for him, it, it was primarily the behavior of people who were carrying the, the banner of Jesus while also... Yeah being full of hate and selfishness and uh, ignorance. You know, there's, there's this phenomenon, John, of people that grow up in some version of the evangelical world in America that, <laughs> that, that they are very evangelical, even in their deconstruction, mm-hmm. in that they, they're going to be loyal to evangelicalism as they reject it, and they reject evangelicalism while claiming somehow that it's the only valid expression of Christian faith. Yeah. And because they have to reject American evangelicalism, they have to reject Christianity. And I want to say to these people, look, that's just one sliver of an expression that's quite modern and, and very uh, unique for the most part to the United States of America in the 20th and 21st centuries. I mean, there, there's the Catholic Church, there's the Orthodox Church, there's the Anglican Communion. That's going to be very different from what you've experienced. So if you wake up eventually and say, you know what, 
I just don't think I can be an evangelical. Okay. That doesn't mean you don't have to be a Christian. That right. means you might need to find a different expression of the Christian faith. Mm-hmm. So, so I don't know. I'm trying. I'm not, my heart is not to be snarky, John. So bear with me. I'm just saying they leave Christianity, but they stay evangelical. Evangelical in the sense that, that they are, they have blinders on about the wider body of Christ and they are evangelistic in their deconstruction. Yeah. <laughs> yep. It's interesting. I, I have never self identified as an evangelical ever. Not, not one point in my life that I say, oh, yeah, I'm an evangelical. I would have said, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I belong to the Jesus movement. And then I, pr- I would have called myself probably, you know, I would have said, yeah, I, I, we're alive as a charismatic church or something like that. Culturally, we were certainly a lot more, well, life affirming, culture affirming than that. I mean, I was never going to be like against movies and rock and roll and that, right. those sorts of things. I did get drawn toward, which looking back on it just seems like, how did that happen? I must have been hypnotized. But I did get drawn into the religious right. But then I woke up and said, no, no, this, this isn't the kingdom of Christ. This is manipulative politicians trying to turn a, ver- a an expression of Christianity in America into nothing more than the religious wing of the Republican Party, and I'm not going to be a part of that. Mm-hmm. Now, the problem is we, we live in a country that is not only polarized, it's polarized in a very clear dualism, left, right, elephant, donkey, Republican, Democrat, blue, red, the whole bit. It's just, it's just – so once you pull away from one, they think – well, he's 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 just John joined the other team, right? And I tell, look, people, I'm just I'm just I'm a revolutionary Christian. I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I just don't have that kind of that. Is, that isn't an ideology that I can relate to. Mm-hmm. And and then and then people hear and they go, oh, that's just you know middle of the roadism. You're just you know the radical center. No. <laughs> There, no, no, it's following Jesus. There's nothing beige about it. There's nothing middle of the road. There's nothing bland. There's nothing easy middle of the roadism. No, it is take up your cross, love your enemy, renounce violence, turn the other cheek, mm-hmm. welcome the stranger. But you do it, you know, it's, it is a radical commitment yeah. that neither Republican, ne- neither American political party or ideology is going to be comfortable with. something I ask every guest, the difference between influencing and enabling. So in the context of you and your story, I think it would be, how would you advise someone who is going through the same changes you went through in your early 40s, but they're not in the pulpit? So they're at this church who uh, maybe is part of the of the religious right, or maybe they're on the part of the progressive religious fundamental left as well. It doesn't really matter. But the point is they are waking up to this third way of Jesus. How do they know if they're just contributing more to the problem by staying or if they're trying mm. to influence the people around them into becoming, into seeing things differently? How, what's, the, what's the balance in that? Uh, you know, I mean, give it some time, especially if you have a long investment in a particular congregation. But your experience within a gathered congregation of Jesus followers should not be generally one of conflict. Mm -hmm. It should be one of support and encouragement. Church needs to be a shelter from the storm. And if you feel like you've got to, you know, put on your armor and cinch up your helmet to go to church, you know, maybe you need to find something. And here, I'm, I'm saying this as a guy that's pastored one church for 40 years. And so I'm kind of a, I've belonged to two churches in my entire life. (laughs) So I'm not a guy that moves around from church to church, but I also understand that, you know, the times we live in are volatile. Mm -hmm. And unless you just live out in the hinterlands in a very, very rural area for good or bad, 
there's a there's a lot of options for you know gathered Christian life in America. Sometimes I tell people just go to somewhere for a season if you need to, where the church leans more into liturgy and sacrament, and the sermon is almost an afterthought. The kind of person that's beginning to go through, again, not my favorite term, but what people call deconstruction, almost by definition, these people are readers and learners, Mm -hmm. podcast listeners, if you will. And so the, the gathering of the saints on Sunday morning does not need for them to be a primary source of instruction. And so maybe you need to find a community where it's Worship, liturgy, prayer, and sacrament is at the heart of what's going on. And let church be something like that for you. So it's, again, people that are really rooted in evangelicalism and then find evangelicalism no longer tenable, they kind of think that there's no other options. Mm -hmm. And they're a little bit, I think you you need to maybe think a little more radically. Uh, Well, what if I started going to an Episcopal church or a Lutheran church or a, for, for someone that's, you know, coming from like a religious right. Well, what if I, you know, found some sort of, you know, more mainline progressive Methodist church and tried that out or something like that? I understand that some people for all kinds of reasons have a certain amount of animus toward American evangelicalism. So be it. Find something that's never been that and that's, that is way outside of that expression and that experience because they're out there. Mm-hmm. But but I think I think to st- especially if you're not in any kind of position of leadership per se, I think to stay and be angry or or try to you know changing people's minds is, is pretty hard. It doesn't happen all that often, and so church should not be a combat zone. Church should be a shelter from the storm. So what's the, what's the best way for people to find you to consume your products and the things you sell and learn from you? Well, um, you know, I, I have an unusual name, and I, as far as I know, there are there. I am the only Brian Zond out there. And there may be another one. I've not met one. So if you just Google Brian Zond, Z A H N D, you will find me on Twitter, a little bit on Facebook, although I don't really engage there. But I do post some things there on a public figure page, Instagram. I have a blog site, Brian dot com. So you'll find all of the stuff there. Uh, it'll probably point you to the Word of Life website where there's probably a, well over a thousand archived sermons, all free. You can go and hear the sermons. Uh, any closing thoughts, advice, wisdom? Yeah, I mean, the only thing I would say is that uh, before you walk away from Jesus, maybe just quiet your soul and sit with Jesus and everything that's troubling you, tell it directly to Jesus and sit and see what might come to you in the form of a word or a sense of the presence of the one who is there, the one who is near, the one who hears, the one who cares, because Jesus really does love you and wants to help you and walk you through all this. Why I Stay is a production of the Patheos Podcast Network, where we explore faith and gain understanding. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave us a five-star review and write a sentence or two about what you liked about the show on Spotify or Apple, and go tell a friend about us. Brian Zond is a preacher, and, well, preachers can't help but preach. I was really encouraged and entertained by my conversation with him. I hope you were too. I can't over-recommend his books because I think they're all great. His latest release, When Everything is on Fire, Faith Forged from Ashes, is available anywhere books are sold. If you're struggling in your faith or know someone who is, pick up a copy and be encouraged. Why I Stay is edited and mastered by Clinton Battles, and it was produced and hosted by me, John Osborne.